Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a deep dive script consult on the first five pages of a TV pilot spec. We're going to unpack a highly visceral teaser sequence, look at the writer's choices, see what he's done that works, and also look at areas where there's room for improvement. And then we'll share the knowledge and the takeaways and our findings. So today I'm putting Grey Cash's script, Incubus, under the knife. Let's get stuck in. First off, let's look at the logline, which is crucial. So there are a couple of elements here, which I think are dynamite, but there's a lot of padding around it and some confusion over what the story is. A, look at the character, a narcoleptic tattoo artist. Brilliant. A, a lot of thought has gone into coming up with a narcoleptic tattoo artist, and I think that's a great character, potentially. Who's forced to carry out contract killings for an ancient Mayan death cult. Okay, I added in the, the D word there, but I mean, I have to say, for me, this sounds fantastic. What doesn't sound so good is picks up grizzly clues, which is kind of, it's it's suboptimal, slowly fleshing out. I don't think you want to be talking about slowly in any logline ever. Movies and TV shows need to hop along at a fair old pace. So slowly, I, I would avoid an adverb like that. And then you've got the key goal, which is his daughter's disappearance. There's too much going on and also... The backstory sounds like it has fuel enough for a whole TV show in its own right. Imagine if it was Breaking Bad and you had a teacher who had cancer and on the side he was running a drug cartel empire. And then his daughter gets kidnapped. And that's the show. But there were how many seasons of this character changing from being a teacher and becoming a drug dealer? So here, from what Gray's telling us, at the beginning of the story, the character will already be carrying out contract killings for an ancient Mayan death cult. It may well be that his daughter disappears and that becomes a season goal of trying to find his daughter. But reading all of that is a lot to take in. Let's look at the, how it plays out on the page. So Dirt Road Night. One of those nights where the rain is pushing down so hard it could sink nails into concrete. Now, what I love here, and I think one of my biggest takeaways on these four or five pages, is that Gray has brought his A-game and really concentrated on trying to bring a voice to this story, which has a connection with the material. So it's a very hard-boiled, noiry, crime thrillery vibe. And the language that Gray has used in many places has bolstered that. And a lot of scripts that I read, I read 90 in the last three months, after I put out a call for people to send me the first 10 pages of their script, and I, I gave them audio notes, and this was one of the scripts that came in. And Gray's immediately leapt out because he had a great sense of voice, but it's not perfect. And there are places in this, these four pages where he's, he's given us too much. He's overwriting, but I'd much rather have a script that's overwritten than underwritten because it's quite binary to just pull out the fat and concentrate on the good stuff. This needs trimming. A late model suburban with chalky white paint and bondo spots dances clumsily over the mud puddled terrain. So mud puddled should have one of those. Do we need chalky white paint and bondo spots? I would say not. And the other thing, a late model suburban dances clumsily over the mud puddled terrain. I mean, what an image that is to describe a car as a clumsy dancer. Having said that, I don't think the verb buys the sentence, and I think it reads better if you say a late model suburban dances over the mud puddle terrain. I think that's a terrific sentence. So I haven't written anything there for Grey. I've just taken out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words, and I think it reads better, my opinion. Then we meet the main character, Vincent Deasy, 40s. So 50% of the clients I work with they, for some reason, add this apostrophe on 40s, 30s, 20s. It's a really common typo and it's unnecessary. Um, so don't do that. One of the biggest takeaways and certainly the most useful piece of advice that anybody ever gave me, I can't remember where I got it from, but I live and die by it now, is introduce your character at their most characterful. And he's introduced just driving a car, fair enough, and he's got his face in the air conditioning. And I th he's backing his face away. So for me, as an image, that doesn't quite do it. Is it, you know, if it's he's drenched in sweat and he's, he's bathing his face in the air conditioner, which said on full, I think that's interesting. I would not have this type of voiceover. 
There's several elements here which feel a bit Scorsese light, and names Vincent Deasy is one of them. Um, bigger problems here is getting past a driver's alert device worn over an ear on surface. Vincent looks like your Kiefer Sutherland type with a $7 tan. So there's a couple of things I want to pick up Gray on here. I can't see getting past a driver's alert device worn over an ear. What is that? It's like a Bluetooth headset? But I don't know what a driver's alert device is. And if it's getting past, does that mean the camera's pushing past? I don't know. So I, I would question this. On surface, Vincent looks like Kiefer Sutherland type. I don't think we should be writing types. Yeah, we can write archetypes, but not to call a character, your main character, a type. You're, you're telling the audience he's a type as opposed to an original character suggested by this terrific logline about a narcoleptic tattoo artist. The good stuff here is this $7 tan. So I would actually suggest that maybe what Gray does is if his first image is this sweating, haunted man driving the car across a mud puddle terrain, and he's got the air conditioning on full, you might say air conditioning vent set full on his $7 tan. So you're using this and his first action to create an introduction. It's a combination of looks and action, I would suggest. And never ever, a Kiefer Sutherland, my goodness. No, don't reference other movie stars unless they're dead movie stars. And even then I wouldn't go there. This dialogue is okay. I'm not the guy you're going to be cheering on in any MMA ring or someone you'd pose down with at Muscle Beach, which I think is presumably capital M, capital B. On the Burbs' rear tailgate as it opens. I don't, the Burbs is the suburbs. I don't understand why we're describing a tailgate as the Burbs, unless you're saying this is a mum and pup station wagon. But right now at this moment, Vincent reaches in and extracts a shovel in this desolate space and time. Better, much better. And here is an example of, we've got a vanilla verb here, the tailgate closes. Yeah, it does, but let's give it some vumph to it. A bigger problem here is the we pan. 95% of the times that the, the construction we is used is not necessary. It, it hooks into one of my big takeaways from reading these 90 scripts, is that you as a writer, you want to be appealing to a reader's right brain which is full of images, creativity, emotion. If you're putting stuff down like we pan or we see, it's triggering left brain activity and they're stopping feeling and they're starting to sort of analyze stuff. So that's why I don't like putting in we's, but the panning, it's totally unnecessary. I think you need to write for the camera, absolutely, but don't actually mention it. So how would we write this sentence where we could get the movement of the camera and any DP or director would say, oh, I know how we're going to do this. And I think, you know, the panning is, is a, a filmic choice, which is not the only way to go. So if you say the tailgate slams rattling, bring in a new word, the license plate, which reads skin craver, I think that's going to give you a visceral little hit and it doesn't pull the audience out of the read. And the panning is neither here nor there. The important thing, the image that is going to trigger your right brain is this number plate rattling with this guy's vanity plate. Exterior dirt road night. The shovel is laid aside and Vincent in a rain poncho crawls out of a man-sized hole. Now I think Gray completely can see the scene. He knows exactly what he's doing. The problem is it's actually not the easiest or smoothest thing to read. And the reason is that you've got to pick up a couple of images here. You've got to pick up the shovel is laid aside. It is laid aside is, you know, it's not a great sentence construction. Then Vincent in a rain poncho. At this point of the sentence, Vincent in a rain poncho. I don't know he's in the hole because I'm reading the shovel is laid aside and Vincent in a rain poncho. And then you say crawls out of a man sized hole. So then I have to reassess the whole sentence back to front and really read it and say, oh, so the first shot is the hole, but then he's done the shovel. And I think there's too much going on here. I wonder whether Gray could do something slightly different here. Maybe focus on the hole. You know, I'd step the fuck out of the way. And then the next image is this man-sized hole and you've got Vincent's laboring in a rain poncho, you know, maybe machine gun by the by the downpour, he slaps the, the shovel on the mud and clambers out, something like that. I mean, it's a, it, this is great stuff. Now, I haven't changed anything with these suggestions. I'm not trying to rewrite 
my client here. All I'm trying to do is unpack it so the, 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 the memory cortex, the memory cortex, that's bollocks, so your mind can understand and process the images in the right way. Hole, man, shovel, out. Let me go back into the car, top of two. Close on the back seat. A body squirming inside a sleeping bag? Double question mark, so it's messy. Um, I'm not emoting here, you've got a camera angle here. Listen, if you've got a body on the back seat, the film crew will shoot it in close up, in medium shot, they'll probably do some, you know, weird overhead shot, but it doesn't lend anything to say close on the back seat. So I'd go interior suburban, a body squirms inside a sleeping bag, or on the back seat, a body squirms inside a sleeping bag. Vincent sinks his hands into the bag, and here we have another sub Scorsese moment. Scorsese, he pioneered this, this sort of freeze frame style in Goodfellas, one of my favorite movies of all time. You know this kid? Yeah. You know where he lives? Another letter from that school goes to that kid's house. In the fucking oven, you're gonna go ahead first. That was it. No more letters from truant officers, no more letters from school, in fact, no more letters from anybody. Danny Boyle in Train Spotting, and he admitted he said, I ripped off Scorsese. But you'd have seen me. I'll fucking meet you. Then the fucking volley be Tommy playing pool. I'm playing like Paul fucking Newman, by the way. And that was it. That was Begbie's story. Or at least that was Begbie's version of the story. You've got the voiceover, you've got the stylistic freeze frame, and then I'm sure Guy Ritchie was probably late to the party. But the point is that this adds nothing. I would suggest, and I have suggested to Gray, that he gets rid of any of this freeze frames. And the important thing is Vincent sinks his hands into the bag. The words mistakes and regrets are inked across his fingers. We all have them. So all I've done is taken off the hands, sinks his hands into the bags, Back to scene. I think somebody must have written a screenwriter's Bible of how to write scripts because at least 30% of my clients are using this construction where you have an insert and then it says back to scene. Now, maybe somebody has worked out that this is technically correct, but I am not a fan of it. It completely takes me out of the read and makes me go back into my left brain when I want to be into my right brain. I want to be swept along with imagery, not given a very cold scene direction of back to scene. So I think we just go exterior car here, um, suburban, whatever it is. By the way, my writing, my teacher once described, I've got a report somewhere where my, my teacher described my writing as being like a drunken spider careering down the side of the page. And that was when I was 10. And to be fair, it hasn't actually got much better. This is all very left brained. We've got a sound description. We slow push, we got a we, we got a cameraman, we got a bunch. Now here's the beef. The important bit is there's a missing persons flyer of Deborah Deasy, who is Vincent's daughter. I just go, you know, he, he sort of unceremoniously yanks the body out of the side door and knocks over, you know, a, a pile of missing persons flyer. Description of Deborah Deasy, I think, Deasy, I think we can push it a bit further. Colgate smile, fantastic. Um, Upturned nose, I think he's trying to say that there's a little bit of arrogance or maybe defiance that this teenager sort of looking down her nose with a Colgate smile, I don't know, but it, it doesn't endear me to her. I don't know what this means. Survival looks for girls without the brains to make it in the world. It sounds cool, but I don't actually know what it means. So Gray might want to look at that. But he's, he's trying to do something different. He's trying not to be cookie cutter. And he's trying to describe his characters with voice. And for that, I applaud him. A reward is being offered. So is being offered as a passive. Information leading to a whereabouts. I think all of this can be just compressed down to about a third of the size and it's going to be something in the region of, he pulls out, in fact, it's almost half a page, he yanks out a body, which is number one, knocks over a mission persons flyers, number two, and you describe her, uh, the missing persons flyer with a reward. So the reward is important because, you know, if he's looking for her, those are the three bits of information and everything else I think is just garnish, it's extra, it can all go. Woods Knight. Arriving at the edge of the shallow grave, Vincent takes a breather. Note to self, jog once in a goddamn while. 50% of you will probably hate this little aside to the audience. You know, it does recall Shane Black. I happen to like it. I like the fact that Gray, Gray has turned up and he's having a go. He's writing here. So I don't have a problem with this. Um, 
Now, here's an example where Gray could have written close on an exacto braid as it freezes abstract, but he hasn't needed to. He's just capitalized the exacto blade. And anybody reading this for production is going to be thinking, well, that's a close up. So this is how it's done. An exacto blade freezes zapstrack. I don't know what a zapstrack is, but it's really cool. Securing the bag zipper, watch that. There's a typo there. Revealing Ray 22, a smooth tongue motherfucker with dimples. Now, motherfucker is one word, but a motherfucker with dimples, oh my word. Okay, so it is in the crime, it's hard bitten, it's kind of Boise dialogue um, sort of description. But I think I'd remember a smooth tongue motherfucker with dimples. Um, yeah, we are in Tarantino territory. Bound and tied, one look at the grave has Ray looking as scared as a missing four year old in a shopping mall. I think I know what he's doing here. I think this is trying a little bit too hard only because we've had two great zingers. We've had this one and we've had this one. So the third, it feels like overload. If you hadn't taught, had the sort of, you know, the, the supreme voice being deployed in here and here, then maybe you get away with it. But here I'd say that's excess, get rid of that. I didn't understand the ear alert device here and I've read it several times and I'd get rid of this. Somewhat startled, too measured, gives his head a good shake. I'm not sure what this is. Now, maybe because he's a narcoleptic tattoo artist, maybe this device is keeping him awake, in which case there is the potential to have this incredible sequence showing his narcolepsy while he's interrogating this scumbag. Um, Gray hasn't done that and there's probably reasons why. But going back to, if I'm reading a script, if I'm seeing a logline about a, a narcoleptic tattoo artist, then it would be fun to see what that looks like. Are you on drugs is not a great line. You know, it's like, are you high, are you on drugs? Because if you are, you need to know that kidnapping is serious shit. I think you could do, you could upgrade this line. I think you come up with something a little bit uh, more incisive. So he tases him, great. Wrong answer, zap. I think this is all good and it, it really starts um, spastic, I'm not a fan of, just because, um, you know, it is a physical disability. Where is she, Ray? Cops cleared me, you know that. Vincent sends him into the shallow grave with a boot. Sends him. Okay, I mean, he could, I guess, you think about the verb. How, what other verb could you use? Could he propel him into the shallow grave? Could he dispatch him? So maybe something with a bit more vigor to it. Then begins subling dirt on top of him. Okay, whenever you use the construction, begin to do something, starts to do something, nine times out of 10, it's not needed and it's getting in the way. So automatically, if I see begins in one of my client's script, I'll, I'll, I'll pull them up on it. I'm gonna pull Gray up on this now as well. So, so Vincent, I don't know, propels him in or sends him into a shallow grave with a boot and shovels dirt on top of him. You don't need to say then, if something happens after something in a script, it's then. Throw him a bone. I don't, this is overwriting here. Okay, okay, there was something. Vincent pauses. This is, pauses doing what? Be more visceral here. Vincent looms with the shovel. Vincent, you know, feels the weight. And it's, give us something, give us a better verb. Upgrade the verb here. Who did you get this from? Lachina, Jamal's bottom bitch. So this is street dirty talk, but it's working for me. This is all working. Vincent continues shoveling. So continues is like begins. It's another one of those words which is suboptimal. Vincent shovels dirt is, is a great paired back noiry hard boil sentence. And the imagination of the reader is going to do the rest and fill in how Ray is behaving. The earth rises in Ray's grave. That's a good line. It's simple, but you can see it. You wanna know where she is? I hear she's been blowing the guys for mini bike rides. Fuck you. Now the kill switch in Vincent's brain suddenly flicks on. He dives atop a rave and there again, another tropey go-to word begins and pummels him with his fists. The amount of flesh separated from facial bone is enough to make an emergency room veteran fucking cringe. Listen, if you have to write fucking, sometimes it's, it's needed, but also I, it's sometimes used because it isn't quite enough without the fucking, which means the line isn't quite doing it. Why do we need the fucking? The amount of flesh separating, I don't, separating from facial bone. I think this is very 
difficult to see. If you're saying that he's pummeling him with his face, separating his flesh from his facial bone, that's an incredibly visceral description, and I'd go for that, and I'd probably pull out on this particular bit of grandstanding. I like Gray's grandstanding. I think 60% of these are absolutely worth it. This isn't one of them. He's beating him in, grabs the shovel to cave Ray's head in. Grabs the shovel to cave. I think, you know, you, again, you can just, there's little nips and tucks. So I definitely bumped on this. This feels like the direction that a director might give to an actor. And with that inner conflict, he breaks down emotionally. This is not working. It's just not him in to go all the way. I think there's a better way of saying this. So he grabs the shovel to cave Ray's, Ray's head in, but he can't commit. That's all you need to say. Ray feels Vincent's weakness. This scare tactic with the grey pussies don't come down. This is, it's overwritten. Ray feels or sees Vincent's weakness. But Ray, yeah, this is not, it's all unfilmable. Spits some blood pulling from a broken nose. So it's probably Ray senses or feels Vincent's weakness. Daddy's little princess cried too when I popped the cherry. Um, Vincent stills. Is that stills or is it Vincent goes very still? Um, I, you know, it's a strange verb. It kind of works. Then in one enraged motion swings, the then lose the then. Stills, probably full stop. Vincent goes very still. In one enraged motion, this is over writing and swings the shovel. Something like that. The screen goes static. That, I don't know what that means. You know, there's a voice, of, noise of static, that's one thing, but the screen goes static as an unfillable bam as we bring up the music and teaser. So overall, I think this is a highly promising piece of writing and a highly promising teaser. Um, it does need some surgery. And although I've given him a hard time about some of those camera angles he's been writing in, he's thinking visually. And most of the, the way through this, he's triggering my right side of my brain and I'm seeing the number plate that sends skin craver. I'm seeing this great big hole. I'm seeing images and the weather's very important. And I, I, anybody who writes a line about a car dancing across a mud puddle terrain, you're immediately saying to the reader, I've showed up. I'm not giving you some boring geographical wide shot. Um, you know, like a car drives across a muddy, a muddy field. That is boring. That is vanilla. It's got voice. It's got something. And, uh, you know, I told Gray um, that he really needs to see if he can carry this through the whole script. Well, thank you to Gray for being such a great sport and allowing me to use his script. I think that there are, there are things in here where a lot of other writers are kind of, they're making the same mistakes. And in the 90 scripts that I read, I've identified about 10 or 11 things that all of us are doing wrong. In tennis terms, they would be called unforced errors, uh, you know, which is where somebody you know, gives you an easy return and rather than hit it back over, you twat it into the net. Oh, can you believe that? For no reason whatsoever. You're not under pressure. And I think a lot of these are unforced errors. So over the coming weeks, I'm going to be highlighting the errors. If you would like me to do a deep dive on the first 10 pages of your script, email scriptfella at gmail.com and I will send you a PayPal request for £30. I will give you audio taster notes, which will take you through my reactions to your script, the way the words are laid out on the page. What we're trying to do here is not just improve one script for you. We're trying to get in good habits and analyze the mistakes that we're making, those unforced errors, which I mentioned earlier, so that we can improve and progress. And then I wanna share what we're learning together as a community so we can all help each other. I look forward to reading you. Scriptfella, out.